Crypto prices pull back as US rates markets push back the timing on rate cuts after a red hot jobs print. Regional banks get hammered after NYCB drops 50% on an unexpected loss and cuts its dividend. And crypto put skew catches a bid as investors anticipate some Bitcoin selling to pay back the creditors of bankrupt Celsius and Genesis. All this and more in this week's Crypto Options Unplugged. Hey everyone, welcome back to Crypto Options Unplugged. I'm Imran Larka from Options Insight. And again, as always, I've got Dave Brickell from FRNT Financial in the studio. How you doing, man? I'm very good. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. So crypto not doing a whole lot in the last week, huh? No, it's, it's a little bit frustrating. Um, I think the Fed for me was, was quite frustrating. Obviously, I think when we spoke last week, um, my expectation was that we would actually see the first rate cut delivered in, in March. Um, and Powell basically poured cold water on that, saying that it was unlikely um, that, that they'll go in March and, and they still want to keep this, I guess, optionality um, and kind of just push back the market from from pricing that one in. Um, and then that was followed up um, by this red hot um, non-farm payrolls print. Mm. So we've, we've pretty much pr- at priced... Um, uh, priced out the rate cut for March down to like fifteen percent probability. Yeah, 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 and and that that's then driven like yields higher, dollar stronger, and they're like big sort of headwinds like to Bitcoin and and sort of broader crypto space. Um, kind of offsetting that, you've got you've got um, and we'll get to this, but the problems in China, um, global growth generally sort of slowing down. So the kind of macro, like the cross asset macro dynamic is really just keeping us very range bound because you've got a stronger dollar, you've got yields going higher, and then kind of reflecting this global slowdown. Um, you, you're seeing our oil still under pressure, um, despite you know Middle East and, and geopolitical tensions. You're seeing copper, you know all, all these things that that kind of points to this slowing global growth. And yet on the on the other side, you've got this U.S. exceptionalism trade um, that that's kind of keeping dollar bid yields higher. And, and again, just for now, putting off us once more fully embracing that kind of rate cut cycle but i don't i don't think i don't think it changes much you know it's 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 the direction of travel that's important mm. and actually if i think back to the fed you know they've, they've now pivoted to out, outright you know dovish in terms of looking for rate cuts um and that's just a question of when you know rather than if um they also have mentioned about this uh, quantitative tightening or the tapering of that um, essentially, Powell set that up for. He said they'll be having in-depth discussions about that in March. So, you, you can take from that that they're going to start tapering uh, QT uh, from the start of Q2, pretty much. So, it still feeds into this easier liquidity backdrop. Um, you know, a, a rate cutting cycle that the major central banks will be embarking on. The Bank of England as well. They they flipped explicitly sort of dovish and and are now looking for rate cuts. Um, so we kind of moving in the right direction. But this this data resilience out in the US keeps just just kind of holding us back, mm. and that that dollar strength and and sort of rates you know yields moving higher again um, from from that macro side of things is just keeping us in this range bound. And and I think Bitcoin's doing what you'd expect given that. Yeah, and well, how big is this regional banks thing? Because that was like ten percent lower that index KRE roughly last week, and you know last time that happened was March last year, and we saw. A big wobble in equities. We saw Bitcoin catch a bid. This time it was like, yeah, nothing's going on. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think perhaps because there was so much going on and, and it, in many ways it was almost like the Fed and non-farm kind of diverted the attention from what was looking to be a really big problem. It still is a big problem um, and it's still bubbling. And, and for me, it kind of highlights again, like the, the, the big picture, like bullish case for Bitcoin and, and crypto in that. I still think this this fiat system is unsustainable and it can't handle higher rates. Now, the problem the Fed have got is if the economy, short term, certainly the backward looking data continues to maintain this resilience and particularly if inflation remains, keeps this stickiness, then the, the Fed are going to have to look at that and, and it's going to be really difficult for them to, to kind of get rates lower. 
Um, on the flip side, you know, you're starting to see again, um, you know, sort of little pockets of stress, um, the, the regional banks being one of them. Um, so, so I think we eventually we're going to kind of reach this crossroads where the Fed are going to have to choose between one or the other. And we know what they'll get, you know, they're going to have to stop the system imploding. Mm. Um, and so one of the big things and, and going back to your point on, um, on NYCB, so they had, um, basically, you know, had to massively revise their, their expected losses from uh, exposure to commercial real estate. And don't forget as well, NYCB were the bank that essentially bought Signature Bank um, when, when that went pop last year. Mm -hmm. um, so commercial real estate, which we all kind of knew was a potential problem in 2024, because there's, there's around like $1 trillion worth of commercial real estate loans that need rolling um, this year. So we're starting to see those problems. There's, I've seen some estimates that commercial real estate is around $1.2 trillion under, underwater. Um, and have any of those losses been taken? And they've not been taken. <laughs> but again, until you need to roll the loans on those, mm. you know, they can all just sit there. But it's essentially what we're saying is there's $1.2 trillion of losses sat there somewhere in the system. Now, you know, NYCB essentially said, I think it's what, around 260 million is, is their sort of loss. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, 260 billion. So there's billions of dollars of losses. Just add a few more zeros. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so this problem isn't going away. And the more we see yields keep going higher, the worse it comes. Don't forget as well, there's estimated around like half a trillion of losses just from from uh, the underwater duration exposure, i.e., mm. banks sat on underwater treasuries. Now they can they can put these in the held to maturity bucket, right? So they don't have to kind of mark those losses to market. But if they need the liquidity, and we spoke about the BTFP, the bank term funding program ending, mm. um, if 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 they require that liquidity and end up having to sell those those bonds then all of a sudden they 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 have a, a solvency issue as well so all the all these problems are lurking there and it's just about timing you know when when do they come to the surface now last week was quite a big moment in that with NYCB bank there was a Japanese bank as well that that got absolutely smashed because it had this exposure it's announced to um, US commercial real estate loans so I, I don't think that's going away and the more yields keep going higher and and the, <laughs> the more the Fed have to put off getting yields lower um, then then potentially quite quickly we're facing big problems and we're back to what we experienced around this time last year or March of last year with the regional banks. And um, lastly on the macro, China. Yeah. So obviously they keep trying to throw money at the problem in terms of lately they just announced ETF purchases to support the equity market. How, how do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been saying for a while, China, China's a big problem, right? It, it's battling this you know, slowing deflationary economy with a sprawling property crisis. Um, so huge problems there and everything they're trying, they, they're trying to kind of, the problem as well, they've got the US that's hiking or, you know, keeping rates really high um, while they really need to get rates lower, but then they don't want the currency to get absolutely smashed. Mm -hmm. So um, they're trying to do this kind of piecemeal, um, you know, let, let's, let's cut some rates here and there. Let's provide a little bit of support. And, and they're not really pulling out the big bazooka, even though they are injecting quite a lot of liquidity. But it kind of feels now they need this big bazooka to really bail out the economy. Yeah, it's, it's, re it's very reactive as opposed to preemptive. It's like when we have to, because everything's imploding, we'll put in a bit of liquidity. Yeah. But only if you make us, basically. And the market just keeps taking them to task, right, and keeps on pushing things lower. Yeah. I saw an interesting report out about China because obviously their new year's coming up on the 10th. Right, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a research outfit in crypto space that has done some statistical analysis uh, called 10X Research, um, done some statistical analysis about past Chinese New Year's, looking back at 11 years worth of returns and saying if you own uh, Bitcoin over that two week period starting three days before New Year to 10 days after, you've basically won 10 out of 11 times and you've returned on average 10%. So there seems to be some very strong seasonality there, right? Mm. And, so, and so the question is, what I don't know what's driving that. Like, what is it in China or China flows that might be into Bitcoin that might be very supportive in that period around New Year? But he's out there talking about that that as a season seasonal trade, which basically means you want to be buying 
something for Feb expiry <laughs> yeah. for a little pop for five to ten yeah, percent. Yeah, over the next sort of week or so. Yeah. I mean, may, maybe it's the Chinese miners that um, that are still out there. Uh, mm. they, they take a week off for Chinese New Year. So they take some supply uh, out of the yeah, game. Yeah, and take some supply out. Mm. I also think, and, and, and going back to the big thing about China is, so... What what the what the, what China are trying to do is again maintain this veil of stability, right? They can't seem to be like panicked, right? They can't, everything's fine, everything's fine. So they're doing all these piecemeal things, and now they're try, kind of banning short selling. They're now encouraging like like sort of state owned uh, funds to start buying and and to prop up and artificially support the market. But underlying all of that, you've got these capital outflows, right? That want to get out because because the the economy is a mess. Um, property markets a mess, stocks are at five-year lows, so, so money's trying to get out, but they've got capital controls. So there's not many avenues where it can get out of. Now, Now Bitcoin and crypto is, is one of those avenues. So I've kind of maintained this assertion for a while that in, in maintaining that veil of stability, China sit on Bitcoin because they don't they don't Bitcoin rip in and it'd just be another reason for everyone to go buy Bitcoin. So they kind of keep 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 a lid on it. And there's kind of two extremes, like scenarios, I, I think, that allows Bitcoin to fly. On the one hand, things settle down in China, they get ahead of it, they're, they're not under pressure from capital outflows, and then they don't have to worry about it anymore. So Bitcoin's free to go and do what it wants. Um, and, and maybe you get a bit of that over Chinese New Year if, if they're not, you know, kind of sitting on it so much. Mm -hmm. The other side is if they do lose control, then it doesn't matter what they do, right? The, the capital is going to flood out. And I, I think there were signs of that on Monday because it was a bloodbath in the stock market and there were signs on Monday that Bitcoin actually started to look to break up and break out. Um, and it kind of it felt like it got knocked back down again. But um, but yeah, if, if they completely lose control, as, as we've seen when they, they sort of devalued, I think in, what, 2015, um, and, and, and Bitcoin absolutely ripped, um, that then you know that kind of offsets and any any attempts for them to kind of keep this stability or this veil of stability. So again, I think what's going on in China is huge, and that combined with what's bubbling with with the, the banks, there's there's actually this kind of potential for Bitcoin to explode higher. Yet the flip side to that is the actual macro and what we see in cross asset macro is actually kind of keeping us range bound. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's probably a good segue into into what you're looking at on the vol stuff, because how we play that, you know, in terms of, you know, sort of short term vol probably keeps under pressure as we probably, you know, maintain this range, range bound trading. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you kind of don't want to be short volatility. Um, you know, if we if we do explode out and the timing, that's really difficult. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of how do you play that? We haven't touched on the flows side of stuff. So ETF flows keep coming, right? I mean, they seem to be yeah. fairly robust and GBTC has shrunk a bit. But like I said, there might be some selling to come because of these liquidations. Yeah, yeah. So, so you've got these potential liquidations um, where the creditors basically want paying out and and from from the um the funds that they've got held in in grayscale on the flip side the actual grayscale selling from from the etf launch or what have you is as materially slowed down mm -hmm. meanwhile you've got the 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 nines you know the new etf inflows like keep keep growing so you, you've you've got that positive dynamic of of now the inflows like kind of considerably outpacing the grayscale outflows, but then potentially potentially we've got this this supply coming back into the market from from the the sort of um, for the bankruptcies and what have you. Um, so that that story is playing itself out again. We, we're setting up for really really you know big sort of longer term supply demand mismatch where demand and the flows into the ETFs will start to massively outstrip everything else. But short term, we've got these offsets and, and that's yeah, what that's we're kind right. of battling. Yeah, those those offsets. Cause, I mean, you know, I look at the crypto single stocks as well. And last week, the digital assets were down small, like a percent or two. But the likes of Mara, Riot, Coinbase got hammered like over 10%. So there's definitely capital fleeing those names mm. and going into the pure play, which is the ETFs. Right. Yeah. So those names were being used as proxy ETFs, not so much anymore. Right. So I think some of that overhang is coming off. The GBTC overhang needs to come off whatever there is left of it. And then you're right. Then that just con that consistent inflow starts to actually do what we think it was going to do, which is just take this thing materially yeah. higher. And, and then and then obviously we've got the halving coming up as well. So. 
Um, the like, I just think it's set up so beautifully, like from a pure supply demand dynamic. Um, yeah, I, I think if the macro alleviates, um, then then we'll just kind of drift higher, and then we'll have probably these explosive moves, um, particularly where we we hit patches where, uh, you know, these kind of air pockets, and and particularly if we hit patches where you know dealers are caught short gamma, and then they're forced to chase it, and all this sort of stuff. So um, yeah, it, it feels calm before the storm is how I describe it right now. And we've we've focused very much on Bitcoin. Any thoughts on ETH this week? Because it seems to have died a death, which I thought it was going to based on my options analysis. But yeah. anything going on fundamentally? Yeah, I, I mean, like, like great shout from you on, on that side of things. And and we spoke obviously last week about how this kind of called overwrite selling and 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 the dealers at a long gamma, um, you know, just keeping us um, keeping us kind of right range bound. Um, but you know, it, it it does feel like we're actually like squeezing a little bit. Um, we, we've got this uh, the Denkan upgrade uh, come in, so that's now live in the test net, um, which seems to be going well. So potentially that comes in March, uh, which again is another kind of positive narrative around around Ethereum. Um, so, so that basically will allow for lower fees and increase scalability of Ethereum. Okay. So again, you've got another kind of positive driver on that. Um, obviously we had a Solana outage, uh, today. Um, oh, really? so that might have taken some shine off of that. Um, didn't they, they did this big airdrop, didn't they? That went quite well, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and like everything, like, I mean, but like Solana has been like the golden child for a bit. Um, yeah, now the outage kind of maybe, you know, takes a little bit of shine off of that and, and then Ethereum can have its day, but it, it, it does feel like Ethereum has been kept underwater. Um, and, and maybe that there's signs just at the moment and, and maybe just a bit of spidey sense on my part, but it looks like it looks like it wants to break higher. And again, whether whether um, the, this kind of dealer long gamma positioning will keep it still like keep that lid on it and keep, you know, keep hitting it down. But um, yeah, it just feels like that kind of it's got that beach ball underwater type feel. Um, to well, I think that's a good segue into this week's volatility analysis where I've uh, done a quick summary for you guys. Check it out. Okay, so if we have a look at Bitcoin realized vol, uh, we can see the green line here over the last week uh, has been trending steadily lower. So it went from kind of low 40s to low 30s now. Um, and after those big moves from the previous week of kind of 5 and 3%, you can see we've been contained pretty much within a 1% up or down on Bitcoin. So really seeing realized vol calm down uh, as Bitcoin finds it, its range um, around that 42, 43,000 area. Um, now, in terms of the flows that we've seen, we've seen uh, an interesting bull trade where, where a client kind of uh, sold out some April strangles to buy back some February strangles. So the opposite of some of the flows that we've seen the week before. Essentially, someone trading vol and saying that the curve has steepened enough um, and April is trading at a bit of a premium now, so therefore unwinding some risk. Uh, in those two buckets. Um, outside of that, we saw outright buyers of puts in June. Uh, you can see that here. And then we also saw a call buyer in March in a decent clip there. Um, obviously, uh, that was a bullish bet trying to trying to play a continuation of the rally. All right, so term structure, the impact of this, this flow wasn't that huge. Uh, we saw on-screen selling in the February especially, which kind of drove that front end down into a steeper contango. Um, but the long end only dropping about uh, half a vol to a vol point. So nothing too dramatic happening. And this is a very typical move that you get in term structure where realized vol is low. The front end just continues to get sold because that's where the gamma is. That's where you can earn premium by selling it. Um, and so that's what all the gamma sellers are doing. They're selling super short day optionality to try and earn their income on a weekly basis. Okay, outside of that, uh, Ethereum flows, we're seeing quite a bit of selling in March uh, via various structures like selling of put spreads, buying of call flies. But basically, the local region in that 23, 2400 strike zone is being sold in March. But outside of that, we did see a chunk of buying in February 2500s. That was when Standard Chartered came out and said they, you know, they thought the ETF would be approved in Ethereum by May. 23rd and we had a little bit of a jump um, and it looks like some short covering came in there on February 2500s but then as spot faded and we didn't really get a break we did obviously start to see um, fresh selling uh, on screens 
and giving all that back. So we haven't really seen a material move in the vol surface either um, on Ethereum, still heading the same sort of direction as Bitcoin uh, and selling off in the front end, just not quite as dramatically as Bitcoin this week. Okay, looking at the positioning side, you can see Ethereum dealers still very much in long gamma zone. This is why Ethereum is struggling to move. Uh, it's kind of stuck around that 2300 area as we flagged last week was quite a high probability. Um, so if you leaned leaned against that, that made sense. Uh, we're pretty sure, you know, most of those uh, more professional vol, set, vol players on Deribit are out there um, selling that gamma because they're acutely aware of this gamma positioning and the kind of impact it is likely to have. So using iron condors or strangles uh, in the short, short end to try and earn some theta seems to be the way forward right now. Obviously, if we get some fundamental news to kind of jolt the crypto market out of this sleepy mode, then things will change and that might we trigger some short covering. Uh, but right here, right now, um, it seems to be persistent. Okay, and then uh, skew wise we saw a bit of a return to put skew, particularly in the weekly expiries, uh, anything out to kind of end of February, as people are a bit more cautious about what the, some of the Bitcoin sellings that we might see towards the end of the month, um, if we do see Genesis and Celsius liquidating stuff. Um, and yeah, outside of that, we're still seeing pretty hefty call premium all the way up to five vols in the long end of the curve. And lastly, the realized vol spread, not doing a whole lot either. We have seen uh, the front end stay around zero, the back end trading about two vol premium for Ethereum and the realized vol, which are these dotted lines coming down both 10 day and 30 day coming down from around eight vols all the way down to about three, four vols now. So Telling us that Ethereum struggling to kind of maintain our performance in terms of realized shouldn't be a big surprise because of the gamma positioning that we've mentioned. Um, but in terms of like the way this curve is priced, we definitely like owning the vol spread long Ethereum short Bitcoin in the back end, anything six months and longer. But we think doing the opposite trade in the one month or maybe the 30 day, um, actually that works pretty well because that will mitigate some of your risk if Bitcoin does decide to have a bit of a move in the near term whether it's from liquidations or the downside, or whether it's from some uplift on the on the halving or anything like that, uh, that could mitigate some of your risks. So essentially, it's a way of getting into forward vol exposure on Ethereum, which you think is still trading fairly cheap. All right, that's what I'm seeing this week in Crypto Vault. Okay, so yeah, that ro that rolling of those Ethereum calls is continuing to supply the street, right? So I don't know, it seems, seems to be as as we are, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's um, yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting setup. I'm saying, and particularly in the context of, of the macro, in that we are in this range bound, um, you know, environment at the moment, and and certainly I, I think the the option space and and traders on there a bit at the moment are, are happy to play that. It seems, um, and it's, it's going to be difficult to fight that because you know timing timing the vol explosions is really difficult mm -hmm. so uh, you know right now i think everyone's gonna just want to keep keep sort of uh supplying the front end um and, and how the, low do they want to take this front end i mean it's already on the 30 handle yeah right? yeah so what they're going to take it down to 20 vol like like equity vol <laughs> yeah i i mean you know that that's yeah. that's the difficult thing right um yeah. because because equally as well then you, you try and get long and then and then you're sort of bleeding theta the whole time mm. um and then that becomes that becomes a painful trade to sit in itself mm -hmm. so um yeah, I, I mean, you, you, you'll trade these markets better than I will from, from certainly from that sort of short term perspective. I mean, how, how do you manage that when, when you know, you, you kind of know there's these potential vol explosions lurking in the background, mm -hmm. but immediately, you know, how, how do you avoid that, that decay <laughs> and, yeah. and, and without, you know, blowing yourself up if we do get the, the vol spike? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean... I'd say for like the fundamentally directional plays, like we're, we're all pretty bullish fundamentally, right? For, for many reasons, as you've described. So if you want to own upside participation in a material up move in Bitcoin or Ethereum, you've got to be looking, let's call it June onwards, because you've had the halving play out. You've had lots of time for that narrative to play out, for the, for the rates pivot to happen, for the cutting cycle to start. All the things that we think are underpinning the rally should have really started to materialize by June, right? So I'd say you park your optionality, the way you keep your theta down is by parking your optionality out to June and maybe even doing it via call cool spreads rather than outrights. Mm. 
-hmm. and that will in itself protect you from uh, from vol just continuing to trend lower and being exposed to too much vega exposure right so that's that's how i think about the directional bets if, if you're looking for income or whatever then obviously you're leaning on some of these positioning indicators that you know we analyze every week and we look at how long gamma is the street is it long on bitcoin is it long on ethereum where, where is that concentration of positioning and what are the flows that are generating that so it does look like ethereum call selling is the biggest driver right now it has flooded the street with a load of eth gamma and we can see it in the price action ETH doesn't really want to move from 2300 really right so if that continues to behave that way then you're just going to be doing super short dated one week two week strangles iron condors depending on your risk appetite and you just do that as a theta harvesting strategy but knowing that yes that could hurt you one day because you get a big gap of 200 points but then you've got other trades in your book that are longer dated mm -hmm. that will kind of do okay in those scenarios right that's probably how you want to play it yeah yeah and, and it was interesting as well um you say there's a seller of the bitcoin straddles what the june was it the june um, so so what they did it was kind of like the flip of the trade the week before so yeah. the week before they were buying april straddles and selling february strangles because they thought the curve was quite flat the front end was going to get hit but april was going to hold up better because it contains the halving yeah and that has, has sort of played out like we went into a steeper contango february got hit quite hard and earned its theta but now you've got to the point where february options just don't have any premium on them really because vols are so low that they're now unwinding those February options and getting rid of some April. And instead of selling the April straddles, they're selling April strangles. So what they're essentially doing is they're getting put into a long straddle, short strangle in April, neutralizing some of that April Vega, but still playing that the market's not just going to sit here between now and April. It will probably have a move in one direction or another. Yeah. And, and are you seeing anything? So next week, so we've got inflation on Tuesday. Um, are we seeing anything playing around that? I mean, that's probably the next big kind of vol event outside of something blowing up in China or, or the US banks. I, th I think like it feels to me like cryptos become a bit desensitized from those individual data points, right? right? So whilst they are impacting the kind of Fed reaction function and, and we do see rates markets shifting on that a little bit, if you look at FX vol, right? FX vol is on its knees. The dollar just doesn't really move that much anymore. Right. And, and also, I think crypto is becoming less sensitive to the macro swings. It's, it's more, more driven by the crypto flows or the crypto fundamental story. I think those are having bigger impacts on crypto prices. So I don't think the vol market attaches too much premium to these broader macro events on a, on a daily or weekly basis. Yeah, interesting. So, what I mean, it, and it is, um, I say, there, there's, there's lots of different cross currents at the moment. And you know, we, we part of what we're trying to do here, right, is, is kind of really pick out a clear narrative, um, you know, to kind of guide people and also to trade. And, and yeah, and sometimes it is a case of, right, we, we kind of have the, the, the big picture theme still playing out, I, I think, perfectly for, for Bitcoin and, and crypto to explode higher this year. Um, you know, name, name, namely coming into this kind of easier rate environment, you know, increased liquidity, the halving, all these things. Um, short term, you know, it, it's it's we, we're just chopping in these ranges. So what what for you right now is what what's your favourite trade um, that that you'd kind of want to be putting on right now? I'd say I've got two trades that I quite like for very different reasons, right? So the first trade I like is owning owning Ethereum calendars against being short Bitcoin calendars. So what is a calendar? Is where I buy a longer dated option on Ethereum. I sell a shorter dated option against it to neutralize my theta, let's say. And then I do the opposite trade in Bitcoin. And, and, and what, what longer date? What is longer date for you? What longer date it would be curiosity? anywhere between June and December. Yeah. Right. But let's call it September. Right. Yep. So own some September ETH and maybe fund it partially or fund the theta of it with something in March, let's say. Okay. And then that front leg, you can keep rolling that. So as you get closer to March and that front leg is decayed, you then sell some April against it or whatever, but you keep your September long, right? And you do the complete opposite trade on Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Where you sell the Bitcoin long in, but you cover it with some short dated. So if we were to get a move in Bitcoin in the near term, you'd be protected because you wouldn't be short loads of gamma on Bitcoin, 
right? Yeah. But the reason you're doing that trade is you're saying that by sometime middle of this year, ETH, Vol, and probably Spot have had a massive re-rating, basically, right? Yeah. And that ETH goes back to a 10, 20 Vol premium to Bitcoin Vol because ETH, like Standard Chartered put out a report recently he's calling for 4,000 on ETH by May. If something like that scenario played out, the odds are ETH Vol is back to trading at 10, 15 Vols over Bitcoin. And so if that has happened... In that trade that I'm describing, you've done pretty well, right? So, yeah. um, so that's one that's one trade I quite like. And then, um, if you agree with this whole Chinese New Year <laughs> right, rally yeah, yeah. idea, which you know you may or may not, but it's just something that caught my eye that I found quite interesting. Um, I quite like using sort of uh, Bitcoin call spreads or call ladders to February to get leverage to that play because five to ten percent on Bitcoin could take us from here to forty seven k, right? And you can get some pretty nice leverage to that if we get that by February. Now I'm I'm not sure we will. I don't I certainly don't see us breaking like 50k by then, right? Or in short order. But that's why I quite like doing call ladder type structures because you buy a near the money call and you sell two calls above it. And so you're playing for that that's uplift. Yeah. But those options that you're short are decaying all the time, right? Because they're only two weeks till expiry or whatever. Yeah. So I think you get nice leverage to a, an upside move doesn't carry badly, doesn't decay away too fast, doesn't even have too much headline delta on it today. But through the passage of time, it will pick up some delta. And as we go through that, that period of Chinese New Year, if there is a bullish dynamic to Bitcoin, which statistically there seems to be, then you get exposure to it. Yeah, I'm still I'm still kind of, And the interesting thing about that, again, is it kind of fits quite nicely in, in that that there's still I still think the market's quite under positioned um, and you know, post the ETF, we had to sell the news event and, and we spoke about, you know, everyone was talking about 35K and now that's looking further and further away, right? And I, I think you're going to, we, we start to break above, materially above that, like sort of 44K type levels, then I, I, you do feel that people are going to chase it because um, they're going to have to chase that positioning um, and kind of, you know, give up on the, on the 35K story. So yeah, it kind of fits that narrative. It kind of fits obviously with with this um statistically uh you know the story around the the uh, chinese new year and then also with the potential for something to blow up like within the u.s banking system um it probably yeah it's probably a nice way to play that those short-term risks mm. um yeah i like that a lot <laughs> cool cool all right do you want to give us your uh we haven't we haven't asked the questions so let's ask the audience right so what do you guys think do you think bitcoin does have a little chinese new year rally like some people are calling for, or would you, or is the next big move actually a down move because of all the potential selling that's going to come from uh, these liquidations from Celsius and Genesis? My key takeaway is I think I'm going to steal your thunder here. Macro hasn't really changed the macro situation. It's the direction of travel that matters. So using dips to get into longer term plays that you like in the space makes a lot of sense. And I'm still going to bang the drum about Ethereum vol longer term. I think that's where the real value is in the crypto space. And um, it's just going to take a little bit of time to play out. Anything? To yeah, yeah, way? yeah. It's sort of similar here. I mean, short term, I think the the kind of macro cross currents are, are, are perhaps offsetting one another, um, which is which is really kind of feeding into this range bound trading that we're seeing. Um, at the same time, we've got some of the bigger picture thematics with you know this kind of unsustainable system e even jay power was saying uh, on, on 60 minutes that you know us debt is long-term unsustainable we've got some of those issues coming to the fore now with with commercial real estate you know more more banking and regional banking stresses which again time them is difficult but they're certainly there and it feels like they're closer to the surface than perhaps they were um, just a few weeks ago cool all right that's it for this week's episode thanks for listening and watching everyone we'll catch you next week